and welcome to our live webinar. Today we are discussing the unspoken legal and financial issues in divorce. My name is Allison Alexander. I'm a financial advisor at Savant Wealth Management. I work out of Savant's Rockford and Chicagoland offices, and I have clients all over the country. I am a certified public accountant, certified financial planner, and also hold the designation for certified divorce financial analyst. After my own divorce in 2006, I realized financial planning specific to divorce was non-existent. As a result, I like to help people undergoing divorce make financial decisions in the short term that have long lasting impact to their financial plans. I guess it's my way of paying it forward. I also enjoy helping newly divorced people rebuild their financial plans and look forward to brighter futures. I'd like to welcome our special guest, Michelle Lawless. She is the founder and owner of the law office of Michelle A. Lawless in Chicago, Illinois. She's a top rated lawyer with more than 21 years experience. Michelle works with clients throughout the greater Chicago land area who are going through divorce and are facing complex legal issues. Her passion for helping clients through difficult situations is obvious and one of the reasons she entered the field of family law. Michelle was just named Lawyer of the Year for Collaborative Law in Chicago. So congratulations and welcome, Michelle. We're so excited to have you join us today. Thanks so much, Allison. It's great to be here. Michelle and I want to offer our perspectives, both legal and financial, on ways you can help yourself both during the divorce process, but also afterward. First, Michelle will talk about establishing realistic expectations and how to create a qualified team of professionals to work on your behalf. Next, I'll share what's most important for you to focus on as you rebuild your financial plan. With that, let's get started. I'll turn it over to Michelle to talk about expectations. Thanks, Allison. And it's, it's great to be here um, talking on this topic. Uh, we, we hope today for all of the attendees that we're going to give you some practical advice. We're going to try to cut through some of the noise that's out there with respect to divorce and give you some, some takeaways on some, some very important issues that people don't often talk about when they're um, contemplating and going through a divorce. And one of the first things I try to do is um, set realistic expectations with clients. And that involves a number of things that I'm going to talk about. But the first thing I do is I want to acknowledge when you start the divorce process, it is completely natural to have a certain set of preset expectations, goals of what you envision your post-divorce life like and what you want to accomplish. But it is also critical to keep an open mind when you are going through the negotiation process. And we're going to talk about why that's so important. So one of the most important thing is understanding all of your options, not just the ones that you come to the process with, and also then prioritizing your options. When you are in a negotiation, there are going to be a number of moving parts, and you may not get everything that you want. But it's important when you start the process that you kind of have a framework that you can reference about what are the most important things to you and what are some things that would be nice to have and things that you really are more of a lower value to you. The reason that that's important is when you are starting to negotiate, you it'll be a puzzle. And you'll work with your lawyer to kind of move things around, but you want to know what's important to you in the beginning. That's kind of your, your stake in the ground for this is really what you're going for. So you have clarity when a lot of different options are coming at you. And one of the things that a lot of lawyers talk about is creativity. And I love being creative. I think when you are working outside of the litigation process, there are a little bit, there are more options to be creative than if you're in the litigation process. But I also often tell people you can be creative, but it's got to be within the bounds of the law. So an example of that in Illinois is child support. Um, child support is required unless the court makes certain findings. So people can agree we're not gonna pay child support, but it's your lawyer's job 
to make sure that your document, that legal document that a judge is going to approve does comply with the law. So the takeaway there is being creative is important, but you've got to listen to your professionals to make sure what you are doing is also sanctioned and approved by the law. Now, the one thing I think every divorce attorney is asked in a consultation is, how long is this gonna take and how much is this gonna cost me? Completely reasonable that these would be expectations that you would wanna set right at the very beginning. Why is this so difficult to predict and why do people get frustrated when a lawyer gives the answer? Well, it depends, which is what we often say. It is because we cannot at the very outset predict what the other side is going to do. So if you have a very cooperative spouse, if that spouse hires a very cooperative lawyer and everyone is on the same page, getting it done quickly and efficiently and cost effectively, your divorce can be done in a relatively reasonable amount of time. However, if both parties are not on that same page, the process will be longer, it will be more drawn out, and that means it will cost more. So it's great if you think that you're on the same page. If you don't think that you're on the same page, you just need to have a realistic expectation that things could be a little bit longer and they could cost a little bit more. And as the case progresses, your lawyer will be able to give you a better idea of what the ultimate timeline looks like and potentially the ultimate cost. And I put this quote from um, Ted Lasso. It's actually Walt Whitman. If there's any fans of Ted Lasso watching this webinar, you will know exactly the scene that he, he says this. Um, be curious, not judgmental. And um, I take that to heart when I'm in negotiations and things are getting a little bit tense. Um, I think it's a, it's a great quote. And the, the whole point of it is, before you are judgmental, you need to be curious. So when is someone is submitting a proposal and it looks like something that you just absolutely don't like and you want to send it back with just a no rejected, have a little bit of curiosity and ask where they're coming from to see if there is a bridge um, to, to mend or something that can bridge the gap. Um, very oftentimes there are. So let's move on now and talk a bit about why divorce cases can be complex even when they seem straightforward. Sometimes people think their cases are extremely straightforward. Then they go meet with a lawyer and they 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 say, oh my God, the lawyer just made everything so difficult. Let's set some expectations about why that is. First of all, the emotional, the legal, and the financial kind of all converge. They all dovetail in a divorce case. And it is very, very hard to put aside the emotion when making decisions. But that is very, very important to do because at the end of the day, your divorce is a financial and legal transaction. Not all cases are the same. Um, there are certain state laws that vary state to state. And so if you are in Illinois, which I assume maybe a lot of you are, you have a very different set of laws than people in California, people in Texas. There are different laws than people in New York. However, tax law is a federal law. So there is an interplay between federal law and state law if you have a tax issue in a divorce case. So the point of all of this is that if you have a friend or a sibling who got divorced in California and they say, oh, we just did this, that may not necessarily be the same law in Illinois. So you have to understand the financial implications, tax implications, and state law implications of your divorce. And you can see why how that could be very, very different, um, even with a very similar set of facts. There are also, and I think this is one of the hardest things that people um, kind of undergo when they're in a divorce case, is the changing family roles in a financial sphere. Uh, there may be one spouse that always took care of the finances and one spouse who took care of the children. And that's how the division of labor was earmarked in, in a household. 
And when you get divorced, you're reshaping the family. And now both spouses in their own individual households are going to be responsible for the children on their parenting time and their own finances. And so there's a little bit of a learning curve with that. And um, in the beginning of a case, you can kind of hit some road bumps with expectations and you just, um, you need to work through them, but know that everyone goes through those and you are not um, really any, any different. You will get through it. And finally, the number one reason every divorce is unique is that divorce, not only driven by state law, which can vary, but it is also a very fact-driven process. And if there is, is one thing that you should take away from my presentation, it is this. Um, every single set of facts is going to make a case very, very different. And let's talk about those facts. What are those facts that make things different? Length of marriage and whether you have children can be two very largely determinative facts of how your case is going to go. I often tell people you have the same set of facts and you drop minor children into the mix and it's a totally different case. That's because with children, you have to deal with um, your custody issues. Where are the children living? How are decisions being made for the children? Um, how are their expenses being paid for? It's not just child support, but their education, their health expenses. That is an entirely different bucket of negotiations than if you don't have minor children anymore. Um, in Illinois, children are emancipated when they graduate from high school generally, um, and that is when you don't no longer need a custody judgment or a parenting judgment. But if you do have minor children, that is going to add a layer of complexity to your case. Another challenge is if you have a privately held business, maybe it's a family owned entity, maybe it's a business that a spouse owns a portion of, it could be a business that provides your family income. And if you have a business that is a family owned and operated business, or a spouse owns a certain percentage of that business, and it is not a publicly held entity, which would be something like Apple, it's more of a privately held entity, you may have to get a business valuation. Um, if you own private equity investments, you're going to have to deal with how those private equity get valued, if they can be valued, and how they're going to be divided. That's a very different case from someone who may earn commissions or large bonuses or have equity positions in, in um, say, a law firm or a medical practice. So those are different challenges, and each case is different on how you value those and how you deal with them. And then the last big puzzle piece is the interplay between maintenance, which is formerly known as alimony, and spousal, su spousal support, and your property settlement. And this is one area that I think can be both frustrating for people and is often misunderstood. But maintenance and property in Illinois kind of work together during the negotiation. And it's a much larger discussion, one that you would need to have with your own counsel. Um, but until you have those two final pieces worked out, you don't have a complete settlement. Because the law in Illinois is that if someone is a maintenance candidate, how much maintenance they receive can also be a factor of how much property they receive. And how much property they receive can be a factor in how much maintenance they receive. So the two of those work together and it can be challenging, but it's all often an area of opportunity for some creativity when you are talking about how are we dividing the estate and how are both of our expenses going to be paid. Now, this may seem very overwhelming, um, especially for someone who has a rather financially complex estate. And if you're sitting there going, I wouldn't even know where to start, let's talk about where you would actually even start because we're throwing, I'm, I'm at least throwing a lot of information at you. I encourage people that you need to set up your team. And the really important thing to keep in mind is that not everyone needs the same professional team. Um, 
you will hear a lot if you do any research on divorce about your professional team, you need to build your own team. And who should be a part of your team and why? Well, you're going to have a divorce lawyer um, because you need to go to court to get divorced. So you're gonna to need to have a lawyer who's gonna um, draft up an agreement. Ideally, both parties have lawyers, so they're both getting um, good legal advice. And then your lawyer is going to kind of quarterback for you generally, who else is gonna be on your team. And you may need a financial advisor to help run some projections or get you set up to receive retirement if you're going to be receiving retirement. You may need a new accountant. You may need some bookkeeping capabilities. You may need a new estate planner. There are a number of other specialists, both financial and emotional support specialists that you may need both during your divorce and after your divorce. And how do you find your team? That's always kind of a question. How do you find your team? You wanna have someone who's credentialed. So you wanna make sure that someone that is gonna be on your team has, has good credentials. They have good experience dealing with divorce. Uh, you wanna make sure that they've been in the divorce world for a period of time. That, why is that important? That is important because in divorce, there are a lot of judgment calls that you have to make. There's a lot of decisions and you want people who have been in the trenches for a while who can provide you that kind of solid, steady um, guidance based upon their experience. You can seek out references um, from other people who have been in the same situation. You can ask other members of the team for references because uh, it's important that your team works well together. And the last thing that I'll say here is that um, you do need moral support when going through a divorce. It is incredibly important that you have the emotional support that you need. You have your professionals to help you get through the legal process, but you also need that cheerleader and those people that are gonna be there for you when your um, professionals um, are no longer in the picture. Friends and family and support groups are a wonderful source of moral support. They are not the best source of legal and financial mm -hmm. advice. And I say that just because it is so important you, that you have them, but it is also so important that you listen to people who are in the trenches doing this work with um, kind of an unbiased view of the world. So um, definitely have your friends and family around to help you get, get through a difficult time, but rely on your professionals to give you that um, kind of more business advice and legal advice that you need. And I will now turn it over to Allison to talk about what happens after you get divorced. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I appreciate your perspective uh, coming from the trenches. You used the right term. So I think of, um, you know, your attorney, as the quarterback, and Michelle used that term, during the divorce process. But once your divorce is final, you know, it, you really do need to rebuild your financial plan as an individual. And that's definitely different than something you might do as a member of a couple. So some of you may feel like this runner, just happy it's over, but others of you may be exhausted and in need of some rest and recovery before considering your next steps. Well, it's not quite time to rest and recover because there are important tasks which need to be done once your divorce is final. That's the bad news. The good news is we do have a post-divorce checklist which highlights timeframes for these tasks. You'll notice quite a few of them are to be done immediately. So this checklist is actually very helpful in tracking what's been done, what still needs to be done. So following our webinar, each one of you will receive a copy of this checklist. So accomplishing these tasks is just the start or the beginning of creating a robust and comprehensive financial plan as an individual. Let's talk about how to pull your new plan together. These are the 10 areas we consider most important to your financial health. At Savant, we take a holistic approach to financial planning because we know that these areas are all connected. 
a decision in one area is going to impact a decision in another area. They're not silos. So after a major life event like divorce, it's necessary for you to revisit your plan and consider the impact of that significant event on each of these areas. After you make sure you have health insurance in place, there are four areas I recommend you address right away as you rebuild your financial plan post-divorce. Those areas are number one, investment planning, because this is the engine that is going to drive your plan. Number two is estate planning. Number three, retirement planning. And number four uh, is tax planning. And proactive tax planning in the first year of divorce is often overlooked. The remaining areas of your plan certainly merit attention, but those needs are less urgent. So let's talk about formulating a new investment strategy. Michelle referenced, and it's true, every household has a different division of responsibility and managing investments may be completely new to you. Let's recognize the obvious. You're now 100% responsible for your own financial security, and this can be overwhelming. And I, I can assure you this is completely normal. People often ask me, when is it best to involve an advisor during the divorce process? And my answer is always the same, as soon as possible. Not only can the advisor be a resource to you and your attorney, but ultimately she can be helpful in helping you transfer, consolidate, and customize your new portfolio. Um, if you're inexperienced at investing, I encourage you to work with a fiduciary. This is an advisor who has your best interests at the forefront. When I work with a newly divorced person, even if that person was a member of a couple that I worked with, we start over with a new investment plan. A fresh start is important for several reasons. First, your tolerance for the ups and downs in the market may not match with your former spouses, and a, a different risk profile might be more appropriate for you. Second, your goals may be different than that of your former spouse. Perhaps um, your former spouse wanted to address, uh, invest aggressively and try to retire early. Perhaps your goals are gifting during lifetime and leaving a legacy to children or charities upon death. Your goals will impact the way in which your portfolio is managed. So last, you may want to consider aligning your investments with your values, either sustainability or social values. A newly divorced person needs a new estate plan. Each of the documents listed under number one should be updated in light of your new circumstances. If you don't have an estate plan, your financial advisor should be able to connect you with a qualified estate attorney for this purpose. People put off organizing their estate plan to avoid talking about death. It's not surprising. If you need some motivation, here it is. When you were married, it's likely you had appointed your former spouse as power of attorney for health care. So now that you're divorced, do you really want that person making end of life decisions for you? I didn't think so. Another example, if you have a trust that benefits your children, you may want to revisit those terms you know, the age and distributions, the permissible uses of those funds. Um, basically tighten up your own estate plan to protect those assets for your children in the future should they undergo their own divorces. At Savant, we review titling with regard to ownership and named beneficiary to make sure assets are integrated with the, the new estate plan. We do this whether we're managing the assets or not. A, a good example is farmland. That's not something we've managed, but we'd certainly wanna make sure that it's titled appropriately um, to make for the most efficient uh, transfer upon death. Last, your estate plan needs to be reviewed periodically because your life circumstances may change, the divorce being case in point, but also legislation changes. So next, let's discuss the third area of a healthy financial plan, retirement planning. 
as a newly divorced person, you, you either kept or received some assortment of assets. What do they all mean when it comes to creating a stream of income for you to support yourself now and in retirement? At Savant, we use financial planning software to help people make decisions in the short term, which have lasting impact on long-term financial stability. So a few questions, just some examples. How much can I afford to spend without worry? And trust me, that's a worry that's universal, no matter what the, the net worth. What impact does this settlement or that settlement have on my long-term security? Do I need to downsize? Do I need to work longer? If the ordered support, child support, maintenance ends prematurely, does my spending need to change? Does my lifestyle need to change? You know, what is my backup plan if that happens? So we can illustrate these scenarios using the software. This is just one page of an 85 page retirement projection report, but I thought it was important for you to see it. When we prepare projections, we're making all kinds of assumptions, spending, investment return, longevity, um, and many more. Our goal is to determine if the plan is likely to be successful. Success is defined as being able to meet your goals and basically not run out of money. For this person, you can see in the first scenario that's highlighted, based on the assumptions they put, they only had a 44% chance of success on their plan. But by changing some of the assumptions and tweaking the plan, by the time we reached the fourth and last scenario had increased to 97% chance of success. We consider this very strong. So let's take a minute to review what we've talked about. You, you have your investments transferred, consolidated, and working for you. Your estate plan is updated and integrated with your investments. Accounts have been titled correctly. Beneficiaries have been updated. You figured out the sources of your cash flow and how much you can afford to spend. You've accomplished a lot, but you're still not done, okay? Because next we wanna talk about our fourth and final topic, tax planning. I'll address the different strategies on this slide, but first I wanted to mention something important. The assets you kept or were awarded have different tax characteristics and consequences. You'll want to be thoughtful about which accounts to use first and in what order to create your cash flow. You'll also want to consider whether it makes sense to sell certain assets and realize the related gains or losses. Work with your financial advisor to map out your tax situation in the first year of divorce. It's a transitional year and there may be strategies you can use to minimize your tax burden. For example, on the slide, if your income is low, let's say you didn't have wages, didn't work, and you have an IRA, this might be the perfect opportunity to take advantage of your low tax bracket and do a Roth IRA conversion. Also with low income, you may qualify for premium credits on the affordable care marketplace for health insurance. This is likely to be less expensive than utilizing COBRA on your former spouse's health insurance policy. Alternatively, if your income is high, let's revisit your goals. If you're charitably minded, you may wanna consider establishing a donor advised fund. This will reduce your income, taxable income, um, and ultimately your tax liability. Other strategies, you may wanna fund grandchildren's 529 plans, great way to shift generational wealth. You may wanna set up or fund a health savings account if you're eligible for that. In summary, although you may be extremely tired that first year of divorce, there may be some real tax saving opportunities that first year, and they're often overlooked. So it's important to look forward. You may have noticed there are few inspirational books about divorce. So I'd like to leave you with some positive thoughts. While divorce is incredibly disruptive and exhausting, it can also be uh, a source of real personal growth and empowerment. Managing change as a result of 
divorce is challenging and overwhelming. We all recognize that. But keeping realistic expectations, forming a team of qualified professionals, and rebuilding your financial plan can help you survive and even thrive in the aftermath of divorce. So Michelle and I have shared a lot of information with you. We hope it's been informative and useful. Now we're going to answer some of the questions that have been coming in during the presentation. Thanks, Allison. That was so helpful. And, and I'm going to grab um, a question out of the, the Q&A. But first, actually, I want to kind of tag on to something that you were talking about. Um, that first year of taxes at post-divorce, it's really, this is a perfect example of having a financial as part of your divorce team can really help. One of the things that I see is often overlooked are embedded unrealized gains in um, some investment accounts. And because the process is so emotional and you may be focused on things like a house and a business, and you're looking kind of like, oh, well, that account is there and we'll kind of deal with that and we'll divide it. Um, having someone who can remind us all, um, most lawyers know how to look at a statement and say, oh, we've got some unrealized capital gains we've got to deal with. But that is important when dividing those assets, because what could unintentionally happen is someone gets hit with all of the gain in terms of how you divide it up. And I do think that is an often overlooked, um, there, there's a number on a statement, that number is not necessarily um, that that real number. So, um, and that can really come into play in year one, I think. Um, or yeah. if, if you get a plan in place and all of a sudden some consolidation is happening and maybe you wanna move some assets around and then someone gets hit with a huge tax bill. Um, right. so, so that's a, that's a really, I just wanted to point that out. Um, yeah, absolutely, that's a, Michelle, you make a great point. And that, um, that can all, really be overlooked if you don't get someone in that's reminding us all. Yeah, I, I, you, you make a good point that, um, all assets are not created equally. So what appears to be a market value actually may have an embedded tax lien on it. For example, an IRA. Those right. ones have never been taxed before. So if you see a million dollar IRA, it truly, it's probably worth 700,000 when you consider the tax, you know, right. aspects or what you're going to owe upon distribution of those monies. I would take it a step further when you talk about unrealized gain. Great point. But um, yeah, definitely. Um, we consider the tax um, characteristic characteristics and consequences um, and the value, the true value, the after-tax value right. when, when going through the divorce process. Right. And if this is all kind of sounding like over your head and things like tax implications and unrealized gains, that's why um, you need a team. That's yeah. why you should not do a DIY divorce <laughs> um, because you do not know what you don't know. Um, and sometimes it's taking into account things that the people don't necessarily think about. So on that note, I will um, I will grab a question here, which is a, a really good one um, about inherited assets. So what happens if someone inherits assets during a divorce? Um, and is it different if someone has um, kind of a could it inherit assets? I'm kind of summarizing that. So this is a great question. And again, I refer to state law because I can tell you exactly what Illinois' law is on this. It's very clear. It may be different in different states. In Illinois, when someone inherits assets that is by operation of law considered their non-marital property, and a court does not have discretion to distribute that to um, anyone other than the person who is inheriting the assets. So if you if you inherit assets during a divorce, you want to keep those kind of in an account under your own name and preserve that non-marital character of that. Uh, that can have consequences on how the marital estate is divided. Um, and the other part of the question is if um, someone has the potential to inherit assets. So in Illinois, if, if um, and I do get asked this question actually quite a bit, if someone has wealthy parents and 
the spouse who married into that family knows that there are trusts set up for, you know, for children and for grandchildren. Um, generally speaking, generally speaking, until the money is received, it is considered a spe speculative and an expectancy, and it is not something that would be taken into account in the um, allocation of the marital property. So the reason being behind that is um, a grandparent, you know, first generation, the, the person who established the estate plan could change it before they die. They could actually write children out of their will. In Illinois, children can be disinherited um, out of an estate plan. So the law does not permit a court to look at potentially inheritable assets, only assets that are actually received. And without going into the weeds, I'm not going to get into revocable and irrevocable trust there if that is an issue. And you have a multi-generational estate plan as part of your, your case, you definitely need to seek individualized attention. But that is the kind of the, the broad kind of baseline brushstroke of that issue. Okay, great. Um, here's a question um, that is that I'll take. Um, I've never had a financial plan. Putting a plan in place sounds involved. How long does it take? Um, it's been my experience that it, it oftentimes does take a major life event for someone to recognize um, the advantages and the benefits of putting a plan together. Um, there's nothing like settling a parent's estate who's passed away to make you realize you don't want to put your own kids through that process and it's time to really get organized and pay attention. And uh, Michelle's reference, just as every divorce is unique with unique um, set of circumstances, that's the case with a financial plan. So what financial plan might work for a young family with younger kids will be completely different for someone who is retired and drawing off their portfolio. So it's very customized to the individual and the family. And quite frankly, that's what I think is very interesting about it. Um, but I would caution you that it, it's a process. To, to really pull it together. Um, you're evaluating 10 different areas of your life and, and you know, questioning, have I taken advantage of all strategies to improve my situation in that particular area? Um, I call myself a friendly nudger um, because uh, I'm good at being persistent and following up on the information that we need to be able to make good solid recommendations. Um, so the, the length of time it might take depends on the complexity. Um, it depends on the type of assets that you have. Um, you know, uh, I oftentimes coordinate with your outside professionals, for example, your CPA, your insurance agent. I've even coordinated with a realtor um, on behalf of clients. So in, in the length of time it takes also depends on how responsive you are as a client. You know, some clients are really quick to reply and provide the additional information and others, it just takes a long time. So you lose a little bit of momentum in those cases. And Allison, you are kind of in the unenviable position of by the time a lot of people get to you, they're exhausted yeah, from the process. And so you do have yeah. to spend time tracking down because they're sick of me <laughs> well, to telling them that they have to track down stuff. And now you're asking them again to track down things. And, and as much as possible, um, if, if I've been involved in the process early enough and I know what the assets are, um, it's, it's pretty streamlined. Like for example, let's take a case where the couple had a joint account and, um, and the, the person I'm working with doesn't yet have their estate plan set up so they, they don't have a trust or they're not comfortable with the terms of their trust. So we'll transfer that joint account into an individual account in that person's name. And then once they have their trust in place, then we'll probably retitle it into their trust name. Of course, we'll do some transfers on death to avoid probate during that, you know, interim or temporary period of time. But that's just one example of, you know, if I get er involved early enough in the process, then I'm well aware of what accounts need to be set up, how assets are going to transfer, um, and the titling beneficiaries, you know, all of that goes together. Right. 
Okay, so not surprising given the, the current state of affairs. Uh, question, a lot of questions are coming in about the, the housing market. So I'm gonna try to maybe consolidate a couple of these and give the broadest amount of um, in, information. So um, yeah, values are all over the place. Interest rates keep going up. Um, and do you buy? Do you not? No one's buying right now. Do you sell? Do you take advantage of this? Um, how are you trying to kind of le leverage a home? The home is one of the most emotional aspects of a divorce. It is also can sometimes be the most valuable asset in a divorce. So I understand the, the, the many, many questions surrounding this. Um, in terms of the equity in the house, there's a question about how, how the equity can be used um, as a negotiation tool. So when I talked about how maintenance and the property division kind of go hand in hand in Illinois, there is a, there is a scenario in which someone could receive a larger amount of the marital estate in lieu of support or partially in lieu of support. That would be for maintenance, not child support. So um, that is sometimes you can look at depending upon certain circumstances, whether or not that would be kind of a buyout or a partial buyout, whether the equity in the home is so much that that could be used for that. The other thing that I'll say about the home is we went through this back in 08 and 09 in a different way because the housing you know, we had the, the entire financial crisis and people could not sell their homes and they were holding on to the homes and agreeing in their, their settlement agreements to hold on to the homes for a certain period of time and then sell them in the future. Most lawyers don't recommend that you do that for more than like two, maybe three years. And it's usually to get a child through high school um, to stay in a school district and you cannot really, no one can afford to buy the other person out or they're not enough assets to do that. The, so there are some creative things that lawyers can do if the parties are on board holding that asset together, but you've got to really account for that very tightly in the agreement, how things are going to be held, how handled in the event that, you know, repairs are needed or things like that. So you can, you know, use the equity in a, in a creative way. Um, the other thing that I'm running into with cases right now is generally speaking, if someone is going to buy the other party out and they're both on the mortgage, unless your lender will let one party assume the current mortgage at 100%, you have to refinance to take someone off the mortgage. And obviously that is extremely difficult with what rates are now. And people are losing really great interest rates because of that. Um, and you know, this kind of is an issue that probably Allison and I overlap a little bit on in, in terms of I'm a little bit limited um, in terms of the law because there's really only a couple of options. One person keeps the house or you sell it or you agree to hold it for a period of time and then sell it, you know, after a period of time. But just for, for everyone that's listening, understand that that period of time can't be like 10, 12 years. Um, first of all, you, you, the, the internal revenue code, in order for this to be a tax treat free transfer, you've got to get all your transfers done. I, I think it's six years, it might be seven, but there, there's a, and plus you don't wanna be financially entangled. That's just my opinion, but I think it's really hard for divorcing people to be financially entangled um, for, for an extended period of time. So one person may have to um, assume a much higher interest rate. And, you know, we're, we're doing some creative things, but the, it's probably beyond the scope of this webinar just because it's very, very, fact specific, but it is, um, it is, it, that is one of the biggest challenges in our area right now are, is, is the housing market. Thank you. I'm not surprised we're getting questions about that. Um, thank you. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. We appreciate you participating. As a reminder, there'll be a survey that will pop up in your web browser after the webinar ends. Please um, enter your question if it wasn't answered live. 
and add it to the survey under our questions and comments and we'll respond. Thank you, Michelle, for being with us today. We truly appreciate it. And if you're looking for more information or would like to connect with either of us, our information is on the screen. You can call, email, or visit um, malfamilylaw.com or savantwealth.com. Thank you and have a great day.